today's, today's scripture comes from the book of Mark, kind of following the service or the children's service story. Um, chapter 10, verses 27 through 31. Jesus looked at the disciples and said, With man this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. And then Peter spoke up and said, We have left everything to follow you. Truly, I tell you, Jesus replied, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields, along with persecutions and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Let us pray. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts together be acceptable in your sight, for you are our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Well, kids think money just grows on trees, don't they? That's part of their overall innocence and their trust in the abundance of life. When you're hungry, someone feeds them. Clean clothes magically show up in dresser drawers. Toilet paper and soap magically appears in the bathroom. And so it's pretty normal for kids to assume that mommy and daddy and grandma or some other loving adult can also buy them whatever they want. We can, why can't we have pizza every night? Why can't we have a new car like the neighbors? Mommy and daddy are rich, aren't they? Well, the late author and humorist Irma Bombeck a young son asked her the question, are we rich, mom? And she stopped to consider what her definition of rich is and see if you agree with her. She wrote, you're rich when you have eight people to dinner and don't have to wash the forks between the main course and dessert. <laughs> you're rich when all of your furniture has the knobs still on them. You're rich when you can throw a pair of pantyhose away just because it has a hole in it. You're rich when the scouts have a paper drive and you have a stack of the New York Times in your basement. You're rich when your dog is wet and it smells good. <laughs> a, few, a few of you can relate to those and perhaps if so, you're rich. Today's story of the rich young ruler may not be one of your favorite passages of scripture. For one thing, most of us probably don't think of ourselves as rich. Like Irma Bombeck, we have our own definition of rich. Rich is carrying a lap dog as an accessory. Rich is having a TV screen the same size as your SUV. Rich is having no idea of the actual cost of bread or gasoline or insurance because your accountant just pays the bill for you. How would you finish the sentence? Rich is, well, there's a humor website called StuffRichPeopleLove.com. And that lists about 100 things that rich people love. It gives us common folk a, a humorous glimpse into how the other half lives. And among the things on the list are fine wine, sailing, cufflinks, pretending to empathize, designer cupcakes, extravagant parties, air kisses, and being right all the time. The website's founder writes a short article explaining about each subject and why it appeals to the rich. And on extravagant parties, he writes, when rich people party, they spare no expense. An entire industry has been launched from the wallets and purses of the rich, driven by their need to outdo the party at the forefront of the A-list. Paris Hilton, heir to the Hilton Hotel fortune, loaded her closest friends into a Gulfstream jet and circumvented the globe on her 21st birthday, including stops in New York, Las Vegas, London, Hollywood, and Tokyo. Now that's rich. One of the funniest items on this list is rich people's love for being aghast. Being aghast basically means being shocked or stunned, but with an edge of disapproval. 
The website author writes, despite the surprising ineffectiveness of changing the world by appearing shocked, the power of being aghast is significant. While appearing surprised may seem easy, knowing what should astonish is the true talent. He goes on to list four things and asks the reader to choose which one would create shock and disapproval in a rich person. Unjust war, wearing gloves lined with baby seal pelts, buying day-old roses, or American states that don't have minimum wage laws. And then he writes, if you are aghast at buying day-old roses, then you're a natural. You must be rich. What if Jesus appeared to you right now and told you to sell everything you have and to give it to the poor and then to follow him? Would he be aghast? Our Bible passage says that the rich young ruler's face fell and then he went away sad after Jesus' words. The Greek word used in this passage was also used metaphorically in Jesus' day to refer to the gloominess of clouds covering the sun. This young man's life was all sunshine and good times. He was wealthy. He was powerful. He was morally upright. If he were single, you'd fix him up with your daughter, no questions asked. And then Jesus had to come along and steal his fun. What was this rich young ruler missing? And what did he give up when he walked away from Jesus? That's the truly scary question that you and I need to consider today. Compared to most of the world's people, I'm afraid to say, we are rich. That may be one reason why this text will not be one of our favorites. We don't think it applies to us. We may dream of being rich someday, but most of us do not think of ourselves as being rich now. Many of us have a difficult time financially. Still, we need to confront the fact that Jesus did warn time and time again against the dangers of materialism. He says in this passage that a rich man will have a hard time getting into heaven. On another occasion, he talked about a rich man who built barns to hold his surplus crops and then died in the night. And Jesus called him a fool who had not prepared for the world to come. If we took Jesus' words seriously in these passages, we might get a cloudy, gloomy perspective on our lives today. In another story, he describes a man who woke up one day in Hades because the man had great wealth and he ignored the needs of a beggar who lay at his gates. Jesus told his disciples to not be anxious about what they should eat or what they should drink or what they should put on. You're not to worry about these things, he said. You're to trust in God, not into your bank account. Jesus warned time and again against reliance on money. He did not say that it's impossible for a rich man to get into heaven. There are many wealthy figures in the Old and New Testaments who, who were good people and who were not condemned. But again, to be fair, to be fair to our religion and fair to our responsibilities, we need to be reminded from time to time of the dangers of wealth. In the first place, Wealth is dangerous when we learn to overvalue things and undervalue people. It's important that we develop a sense of perspective about life. For some of us, accumulating things has blotted out the importance of the people who are around us. Marjorie Holmes was a best-selling Christian author who wrote a prayer many years ago asking God to help her deal with her desire for possessions. I want to quote a couple of lines from this prayer. She said, My senses are tormented by the dazzling world of things. Lord, cool these fires of wanting. Help me to realize how futile is this passion for possessions. And she goes on to say in the prayer that recently one of her best friends died in the midst of her possessions. This friend and her husband had worked so hard to decorate their home with the finest furnishings and china and oriental rugs. Now her friend was suddenly gone and her pretty possessions remained as a sad reminder. And Holmes ends her prayer by saying, but let me learn something from this loss. 
The possessions are meant to enhance life, not to become the main focus of our living. I think I have money and possessions in their proper place until I read this story of the rich young ruler. And then I wonder if Jesus were to make the same demand of me at this very moment. Sell everything you have. Give the money to the poor and follow me. Would I be wanting to make excuses? Would I be aghast? Would I walk away from Jesus and from abundant and eternal life? Lord, let us learn something from this loss. Sometimes we're forced to make choices. Some of us listening today have to make hard decisions about the time we spend earning a living and the time we spend with our families. In other words, we have to make a choice about what's important to us. Wealth is dangerous when you begin overvaluing money and undervaluing people. Wealth is also dangerous when we see our possessions as an end rather than as a means. When the accumulation of great wealth is our primary reason for living, then we're in trouble. Wealth is simply a means to improve the world, to improve our community, to improve our lives. But when it becomes an end, then it is dangerous. Writer Ernest Hemingway had one very wise practice. On the first day of each new year, Hemingway gave away some of his most prized possessions. When asked about this, he said, if I can give these things away, then I own them. But if I can't give them away because they have somehow become so important to me, then they own me. It's not necessary for wealth to keep you out of the kingdom of God, but wealth can be a snare that can stop your spiritual progress if it becomes an end rather than a means. Now this brings us to the final thing to be said this morning. Wealth can be dangerous if we print on our money in God we trust, but in our hearts we trust in mammon, our money and our material things. In his 2005 commencement speech at Kenyon College, author David Foster Wallace said something really thought-provoking. He said, in the day-to-day -day trenches of adult life, there is actually no such thing as atheism. There's no such thing as not worshiping. Everybody worships. The only choice we get is what we worship. Amen. Now think about that for the moment. The only choice we get is what we worship. He went on to say that whatever we worship will eventually consume us. If we worship appearances or money or status, we'll spend all of our energy on these things. Whatever we worship eventually comes to control our lives. And most of us aren't even conscious of what we really are worshiping until, like the rich young ruler, we're asked to give it up. Foster ends his meditation by saying, they're the kind of worship you just gradually slip into day after day, getting more and more selective about what you see and how you measure value without ever being fully aware that that's what you're doing. There are many of us, if we were asked, who would say, oh yes, I trust God. But in our heart of hearts, we know that we are much more concerned with the value of our IRAs, our pension, our social security, our property, and our investments. We've slipped into worshiping wealth, security, certainty, and control. What does our anxiety about these things teach us about our relationship with God? Jesus told us not to be anxious about life, that God will indeed provide. That doesn't mean now that we're not to, be, we're not to prepare for our old age. We need to do that. It does mean that wealth is not our ultimate security. Our ultimate security is with God. Now, I'm aware of how glibly we often say, trust the Lord, when we really mean we're going to trust in our own devices. Yet there needs to come that time when we settle the issue once and for all. What is the source of our ultimate security? Is it our bank account, 
our investments, our property, our status, or do we trust in the love and the providence of God? It's harder, said Jesus, for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God than for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. That's strong symbolism, but we need to recognize the dangers of wealth. It can keep us out of the kingdom of God if we overvalue money and undervalue people. If we see money as an end and not as a means. If we write upon our money in God, we trust, but within our hearts, we trust in our material accumulation. At some point in our lives, we all have to choose who or what will we place our trust in. We all have to choose what we'll value, what will take first place in our lives. Jesus didn't try to make this choice any easier for us. In every generation following, Jesus means giving up the things that our culture values. It means giving up our own security and our comfort and our control. But Jesus also ends this passage with the promise that whatever we give up for him will be returned to us a hundredfold through the riches of knowing him and sharing eternal life with him. Learn from the loss of the rich young ruler. Decide now that following Jesus is worth more than anything else in life and discover the rich blessings that he has for all those who put their total trust in him. Amen. Oh,